Hello, everyone. My name is Cesar Rodriguez Veravito. I'm the um, mm. chair of the Center for uh, Human Rights and World Can Justice. Can you guys hear me? My internet keeps going in and out. And the uh, director of the Climate Litigation Accelerator, CLX, which is hosting this webinar. We host a monthly webinar on topical issues uh, on climate action and climate litigation. And today we have a very special event uh, that we were looking forward to for a long time. Uh, we're discussing a critical phenomenon in climate politics, governance, and law, which is the rise and role of the youth climate movement. As we all know, the youth climate movement has been able to clarify the moral urgency of swift climate action like never before. They have pushed the boundaries of political and legal discourse and action on climate change and have leveraged their activism to pressure governments and corporations on their climate records. And in short, the youth climate movement in many ways sets the agenda for climate action. And also since this is a space that's uh, uh, been established mostly uh, to discuss uh, climate legal actions and litigation, um, we also know that uh, young people and youth led organizations have played a critical role in bringing some of the key cases uh, before national and international courts uh, around the world. Uh, and yet most discussions and decisions on climate action and litigation do not systematically incorporate young people's voices. And this point uh, was brought home for me at least uh, very powerfully in an event on intergenerational solidarity that was organized by a number of youth-led organizations uh, in December in which um, uh, several of speakers from youth-led organizations acknowledged the contribution of legal action to their own uh, mobilization, their own causes, but also uh, uh, mentioned that they felt um, only partially included in the conversations that led to those uh, lawsuits. And also more importantly, in the politics and in the social mobilization around those cases um, and suggested very specific ways in which youth voices could be meaningfully and systematically included in those conversations and efforts. So partly because of that uh, very encouraging and also thought provoking conversation, we at CLX decided to launch a whole line of work uh, uh, on uh, climate litigation and uh, youth movements uh, that we are launching with this conversation. And so this is a long-term commitment that CLX is making to contribute to this convergence between youth activism and uh, climate uh, legal action. And today we have the opportunity to hear from three leaders of the youth climate movement. For this webinar, I'll, be, uh, I'll begin with the moderation of the panel and then pass it over to my colleagues, Jackie Galan, uh, a litigation associate at CLX and Arkita Codiberry, a postdoctoral researcher and scholar at CLX. Uh, I'm gonna introduce uh, the panelist speakers as uh, I go around this virtual room asking a, a first opening question to uh, each of them. The idea is for, uh, as, uh, as those of you who have come to previous uh, CLX webinars in the past, um, we aim for rapid fire kind of exchanges of, uh, in our roundtable format as opposed to uh, panel presentations. So I'll begin with uh, Shiji Bastida, uh, who's a Mexican climate justice activist and a member of the indigenous Otomi Tolteca people. She co-founded the Re-Earth Initiative, has taken a leading role in Fridays for Future, and other youth-led climate groups and has organized student climate strikes and other actions, among other things. She's currently a sophomore at the University of Pennsylvania. So she welcome. And the question to you is, how do you understand the problem of climate change and how do you, com and how do you communicate and frame the problem to different audiences? Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, hi, everyone who's watching. And, you know, Aisha and Disha have we have all known each other for a long time, so it's such a pleasure to be sharing this space with you both. Um, and I think that I can speak for a lot of youth activists when I say that we want people to understand the problem of the climate crisis as a systemic issue in terms of really noticing that the way that it has been framed for the past 50 years in terms of 
environmentalism and protecting national parks and you know advocating for recycling all of these things have been very directed towards not looking at systemic issues and not looking at how communities individually are being affected and so we want to bring and change that conversation to you know the climate crisis is about air pollution the climate crisis is about water pollution the climate crisis is about where all of these facilities are located and where this pollution is going and how there's a you know a lens of justice when it comes to every decision that is made about um all of the systems that perpetuate the climate crisis including the siting of the fossil fuel industry and so that is what we're trying to really bring home to people the fact that um because the climate crisis touches every single point then everybody can be part of the solution if you are part of you know um, you know, we talked about artists and we talk about um, filmmakers and we talk about writers and we talk about journalists. Um, all of these different sectors have to be part of um, bringing home the fact that everybody has to start caring about the climate crisis in a way that is personal. Um, and that is when we get to communicating uh, these issues to where people are at in their understanding. Because I think when you are in this space for a while, you end up using jargon, you start uh, assuming that people know everything that you know, and you miss a lot of the connections that can be made. Um, and you know, I in school and elsewhere, I've studied the psychological reasons for why people don't care about the climate crisis. And one of them includes the psychological distance and how it has been framed as happening in 50 or 100 years and how it has been framed as happening far away from you. Uh, so when you tell people it's happening already, when you tell people that flood or that um, wildfire that happened near you, that is a product of the climate crisis, it really changes people's perspectives on where we are in a timeline. And I think that the media has a huge uh, role to play in uh, communicating the immediacy of it. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is that language is very important. And, you know, I grew up in Mexico. I go back to Mexico all the time. And knowing how to communicate climate information to a specific area is one of the most important uh, skills that we have to develop. Because it's not just about translating directly, but using the cultural, um, you know, being culturally sensitive to how things are communicated. And I think we miss a lot of that because most of the information is in English and it's in academic English. So we are working a lot within our different groups to make sure that information is accessible and information uh, can reach um, people in a cultural way. Thank you, Shia. That's a great start for our conversation. Uh, now we're, uh, I wanna introduce uh, Disha Ravi. Disha is, climate, uh, justice, is a climate justice activist and a founder of Fridays for Future India. She's passionate about climate justice issues and spends much of her time working on the Fridays for Future initiative addressing most affected people and uh, areas. Disha is also an aspiring climate journalist, her writing already appearing in key news outlets like uh, Al Jazeera. So Disha, could you talk about your experiences organizing with Fridays for Future India and what you've learned about the risks that youth activists in India and other, in other parts of the world face in trying to push for climate action? Yeah, thank you so much, Cesar. Um, it's such an honor being here and sharing space with two of my uh, closest friends. And it's, it's so nice to um, talk about something we all work together. Um, and to answer that question, I think just quite literally before this panel started, uh, we got bail for two activists in F of India who were arrested for um, anti-dam projects in Arunachal and Assam. These are artists who got arrested uh, for protests that they did during the global climate strike that happened on the 25th. Um, and they were picked up, one was picked up in uh, Arunachal, which is a region in India, and another in another city in Assam. And it didn't even make it to mainstream news. It um, it was ignored, like, because people get picked up every day because it's the norm. Because here, being able to protest is a privilege, but also at the same time, 
it's the only thing people have. Uh, being arrestable is, is a privilege because not everyone can do it. I know Extinction Rebellion uses tactics where uh, they make themselves arrestable by disrupting um, traffic but or in some way being disruptive, but that's not something that we can do in India because the most basic form of protests are considered disruptive by itself. And these people were arrested because they painted a wall, um, a government building, and they said no more dams because they were building dams in their region and they got picked up for that. Um, and they were all, one of them were act, one of them was actually beaten and tortured in custody, and we only found out now. So it was like a hectic four days. So while at the same while at the same time that we we can't we don't really have an option except to protest, but the consequences of this can be really grave. And this is in a space in India where environmental activism isn't even considered activism because there are more um, more human rights violations and uh, that are often ignored and brushed under the indigenous people in India, tribal communities that go to the prison on a regular basis. And these risks happen, never reach mainstream media because it's so normalized. So I think having protests in India is a huge risk and it's a risk that is very depending on the caste you come from, depending on the religion, depending on the region you're from. And I think just that is in itself a privilege, but also what else can we do if not use the small privileges we have? So it's a, a little bit of a circle where you, you know what's going to happen if you do it, but what will you can't really not do it. So that's, I think, where we're coming from because it is essential to um, continue doing what we do. Thank you, Disha, um, for sharing those very concerning news. Uh, and, uh, and I wanted to emphasize something that Disha said, I mean, you can't. Uh, I promise not to be long-winded, but this I need. I think we need to pause a moment because this is a this is a situation in which a a, a group of young people uh, protest um, in a very kind of run-the-mill type of protest that we've seen uh, for a long time going on around the world against large dams. I've been part of some of those protests elsewhere in the elsewhere in the world in Latin America, and it's, it used to be that the grown-ups would be the ones picked up. Um, and now we see young people coming out on the streets and uh, very forcefully and being uh, perceived as a threat to authoritarian governments like uh, India is becoming uh, India is becoming uh, more and more of by the day. So while we're paying attention for, of course, very good reasons to what's going on in elsewhere in the world, in Ukraine and, and, and other places, other governments like India's continue to become more and more authoritarian and uh, anti-environmentalism and um, anti-youth um, crackdown um, are part and parcel of those authoritarian um, packages. Elsewhere, in Brazil or you name it, in uh, uh, Turkey and elsewhere, you see in this pattern in the Philippines, uh, you see this pattern uh, cutting across the, the world. So very classic, very traditional, conventional human rights issues like right to freedom of assembly, uh, right to physical integrity have become a, a crucial component of youth activism. And I would invite everyone here um, in attendance and also people who will be watching the recording of this meeting uh, who are human rights and, and environmental uh, justice activists and lawyers to fully incorporate this component into their work. It's not just about suing governments and corporations for failing to bring down uh, carbon emissions, but it's also about protecting young people's right to mobilize on the streets. Um, so with that, uh, we'll um, turn it over to Aisha uh, Sidika, who's a climate justice activist based in New York City. She launched uh, Polluters Out, which seeks to eliminate the influence of fossil fuel companies um, at the UNFCCC's uh, COP Conference of the Parties and Fossil Fuel University, which trains youth climate activists on how to fight the fossil fuel industry. She's currently a New York Coro Fellow, and we're proud to announce that she will be a CLX Fellow uh, uh, soon. So 
Aisha, can you explain what polluted salt and fossil fuel, uh, fossil free university are and why you started them? Uh, sure. Before I do, I'd love to give a shout out to Katie Redford, who's in the house uh, watching. Uh, Katie is the reason we launched Fossil Free University, um, and it was a project of Equation Campaign, so it wasn't just polluters out. Um, but um, I started polluters out, and um, with the help of Katie, uh, FFU after the climate protests on September twentieth, two thousand nineteen, which um, I organized with Shea over here, um, and and then Shea uh, attended the UN climate summit after after the protests in New York. Um, so I can tell you a little bit, but if I miss anything, Shea, please. Um, feel free to insert. That year, um, with other activists, we, the youth climate movement, mobilized over 7.4 million people. And it was the first time in, in history that so many children were involved in a mass protest. You've had protests before throughout history, but they've never been um, led by, by kids ages 15 to 19 and at that moment i thought we had made history i really really believed that we were going to change something but um the policies and legislation that came out of the un youth summit later cop 25 not only disappointing it felt like people were applauding the youth movement um, but not committing to any long-term solutions and by long-term solutions i mean financial promises the climate crisis is as much of a political issue as it is a financial and an economic one and that's something that we um, overlook a great deal the purpose of the united nations framework of climate on climate convention uh, is to mitigate the climate crisis. That's the reason that they were formed in 1998. So it is very ironic that their own climate talks, such as the annual conference of the parties COP, are not only influenced by big polluters, they have money coming in from the likes of Shell, BP, Chevron, most recently Unilever, and even the people who were associated with Guantanamo Bay helped or were trying to get involved in the creation of the youth call before the conference of the parties and the youth had to step in and protest now the the point about Guantanamo Bay hits twofold for me it hits it hurts twofold um, because I grew up as a Muslim in post 9-11 New York uh, my community has been surveilled, um, illegally put into jails in Rikers Island. Um, Guantanamo Bay is one of the places I associate with so many human rights violations. And then second, I'm Pakistani by nationality and birth. And um, uh, Cesar, you were just talking about the effects of war on the climate crisis and its link to the climate crisis. To me, this the predicament that we are in of climate disaster is a direct result of our wars for resources in the Middle East. It's only exacerbated the climate crisis. Um, so it was beyond shocking that the conference of parties where 94 nations come together had a sponsor that helped create one of the biggest prisons with human rights violations. Um, and, and so uh, to continue, the problem with this fiscal sponsorship and these um, associations is more than just the damage that, um, that they were doing to the integrity of a conference. But it's about the um, damage that they do to robust climate legislation. In many policies that have come out of COP, including the Paris Climate Agreement, the fossil fuel lobby has made an effort to contradict the demands of civil society. Um, I've had this conversation with Xie too, 
the, the Paris Climate Agreement avoids the word fossil fuels. Um, and because of this influence, um, it does not call for fossil fuel deproliferation. And this is the most important binding agreement, the Paris Climate Agreement in climate legislation. So what this does in, in the long term is these edits harm the global South nations, they harm indigenous communities, and they prevent the autonomy of land, specifically in the Brazilian and Ecuadorian Amazon, um, for people, and they're not guaranteed because of fossil fuel subsidies, fossil fuel um, uh, lobbying, and that's why I, I helped create polluters out. The whole goal is to get the UNFCCC, fossil fuel companies, and the United Nations um, to sign a conflict of interest agreement, and so that this does not happen anymore so that we don't have a cop 27 cop 28 cop 29 where essentially nothing happens because um there's funding from an outside side source coming in and it is actively um corrupting positive or progressive legislation thank you aisha for those key points as well um and this again reiterates the importance of intergenerational dialogues and collaborations uh, that uh, we're launching uh, with this event um, and reminded also of efforts by activists like Bill McKibben uh, to try to mobilize people um, um, over 60 uh, in, in a very savvy uh, reading of the political landscape because people over 60 tend to have more time in their hands also more money and also can take greater risks uh, and also can afford them. And as Disha said, well, some of them, some countries can afford and have the luxury of uh, being able to be arrested without the consequences that uh, even younger people uh, have to endure. So this is very much the intentionality of not just this event, but the series of conversations and action-oriented conversation, uh, collaborations that CLX and other organizations, including youth-led organizations and organizations like Third Act are pushing forward. And um, so I was here, the only reason why I was moderating this segment was because I was seen as the member of a different generation and an older generation. And so I'm gonna disappear for the rest of the, of the, of the meeting and, and turn it over to a younger generation of um, really uh, fantastic researchers and lawyers uh, represented here by uh, Jackie and Arpita uh, to um, take the conversation forward. So the floor is yours. <clears throat> Great, thank you so much, Sedlar. Uh, and speaking of intergenerational collaboration and representation, we're gonna shift gears a little bit to um, that very topic. And so my question for the panel is, um, what do you think youth climate activists need from older generations, including and perhaps especially lawyers? Um, and what kinds of support would help amplify the youth climate movement? Um, and before I pass it to the panelists, just a reminder that at the end of this, we'll have a Q&A portion. So definitely to uh, the audience, submit questions that you might have for our fabulous panelists. So, Perhaps we can go in the same order. So we'll start with Shia and then go to Disha and then Aisha. Um, so yeah, I'll pass it to you, Shia. Uh, Thank you. I realize our, our name's gonna rhyme there. <laughs> um, but yeah, with this question, I think when we talk about intergenerational cooperation, what I've noticed, and I'm sure Aisha and Disha have both noticed this, is that things don't happen at the negotiation tables. Like even if we get a space at the negotiation tables, that's not where things happen. Things happen at the side events, things happen at the after parties, at the galas, and we don't get invited to those things. And if we do get invited, we're usually the only youth who gets invited to fill the youth quota. So I think that we need to say this out loud so that people understand that we are aware. Um, and also understand that it's very different um, situations to be in, I can go up to a podium at COP26 and talk about my, what my experience is, but the things are not going to be received because 
I'm just seen as another person who's talking about something that they've heard a thousand times before. But the issue is that now we have a deadline that we can't compromise with. And that is why we are going up there and being vulnerable about our experiences when we don't owe anybody our, our, our vulnerability. And when we talk about lawyers and when we talk about um, all of these class of professionals that have so much more influence than we do, I think that what we really want is for everybody to, and to really, you know, start suing companies, to start suing, you know, politicians, to start digging the dirt on what is going on, because we think that the climate crisis is just a symptom of the system, but a lot of the times, and most of the times, it's intentional. Exxon hid in climate information for over 60 years. That was intentional. Um, you know, Biden at the at COP26 said, we are going to reduce carbon emissions um, by 50% uh, by 2030 from 2005 levels. And he hit every single point that we wanted to hear, except we want to hear from 1990 levels, because that's what actually makes a difference. And he switched it to 2005 levels. So that is misinformation right there. That's a form of greenwashing your speech. And those are the things that we want to be able to call out. And we non don't necessarily have the knowledge, the information, the avenues to call these thing out, things out. Um, you know, when companies have an Earth Day campaign and they have two or three of us on, you know, their things and we think we're making an impact, but it's just 3% of their production of the total production is made sustainably. So all of these things are things that are happening everywhere with, um, with food stability, with energy, where energy comes from, there's people with influence who want to keep their profits. And all of these things are intentional. So we need, uh, especially people who, not only lawyers, but people in every level of influence to start not being silent about any of this. And I can tell you, whenever we go into a room, people get uncomfortable. Because when we call all, all of these things out, when you know, Citibank asked me, what are you looking for in a company? And I said, trust. And they can't give me that. That is when issue, things get uncomfortable, but that's the only way in which things are going to change. So I don't know if that answered your question very much, but the support that we need is people to help us dig out the truth and people to see this as not only an issue of, of miscommunication, but an active wanting of keeping profits where they're at, at the expense of communities and at the expense of the global south. Thank you so much for that very, very thoughtful answer. Um, so then we'll just pass it to Disha, same question. Um, I, I know Adpit has also asked me this question quite a few times and we've had these conversations. Um, and I do believe that having lawyers, environmental lawyers especially, but mostly also criminal justice lawyers in India will be very helpful uh, because we get into more <laughs> issues with the government than we do with the environment. But um, I think one thing that we both agree on is the fact that while it's important to hold um, companies and the government accountable legally by taking them to court, the truth is that court cases take years. They take years to go by and often uh, there have been judgments that have come out that have been so vague that they give more power to the oppressor instead of the people who are having to face the consequences. So even in India, the laws we have, uh, in, in the environmental laws we have are so vague with definitions that it's really hard for us to actually use those laws to um, you know, take anyone to court. And they've been weakening this, uh, these laws over the last few years. So what, exist today is already ridiculously weak and there is no trust in the courts at this point because they haven't shown favorable results in the environment and the common um, notion in my country is that when you stand for the environment you're opposing development of any sort they don't see that they go hand in hand they don't see that when we ask for the trees to remain um, or the mines to not be open we are asking for a more sustainable future where people are prioritized over the coal and the ground but 
instead it's seen as a vicious thing that's going against the development of the country and in, in turn going against the country itself. So um, it really becomes a vicious cycle to navigate. Um, so I do, but I do believe that it's important to even have these small victories environmentally and still take them to court because at least they know that there is another side fighting, that there is um, another voice out there and someone willing to hold them accountable. And I think that's an important concept to uphold, um, even though it may or may not have results. But I think personally, we would really like human rights lawyers and criminal lawyers because I'm just so tired of seeing my friends go to jail and I, I don't think I can bear it anymore. Let's see. Uh, yeah, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, really appreciate your insight. Um, so with that, we'll just pass it to Aisha. Um, my answer is twofold, if that's okay. Um, the first part, specifically, what can older generations do to support um, youth activism? It's very simple. Um, we need your help financially, especially Black and Brown and Indigenous youth organizers who historically receive less than 5% of philanthropy and grants and stipends for environmental work, although um, we are the leaders in environmental work before even youth activism was a term. Um, those of us who come from tribal or uh, native communities have been doing this for generations without even the, the um, vocabulary that has now become um, so popular in media. And uh, I also want to highlight that those of us who are fighting against the fossil fuel industry we are up against the most powerful, well-funded industries um, in, in recent history. And what we have oftentimes is our will and play cards. Um, and this goes to my second um, reasoning. I think there's an active youth poaching occurring from the industry. Um, Shea was pointing on this fact earlier that we are invited and we we do the speaking and then we're not invited to those side side events where actual events are happening. But to the to the point of um, our faces are used as as these um, symbols of progression. Um, oftentimes companies take advantage of youth naivete. Um, I know when I started doing this work at 18, 19, I found myself signing contracts that I didn't even understand, but I had no one to ask in my like immediate community, hey, can you help me uh, understand this? Because um, I'm doing this work sheerly and purely for, for the good of the environment, but I haven't yet uh, attained a legal education. So I don't understand this. And that's just an example about myself, but it's happening worldwide. Companies are reaching out to 16, 17 year olds and they're telling us they wanna do good. And so we're so eager to collaborate with them. And then an NDA is signed and we're taken advantage of. Um, and that's a really scary reality that is well known among our community, the youth community, but it's not necessarily known among adults. And these contracts can be um, as bad as you are not allowed to work with other people for two years to we're going to take your face, plaster it all over social media, and then continue <laughs> doing all the bad things we're doing, but um, we are now using your face and you can't do anything about it. Um, there's also, and when you rise to, I suppose, popularity or fame, which I am not going to suggest that I haven't because the world is ending, which is a really, really horrible paradox. You also are more prone to attacks. Um, just, I have friends in California who are now, um, constantly being threatened, constantly being stalked, um, and not only on 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 social media but people are 
so quick to file lawsuits against youth for the most minute things and it doesn't make sense and the only reason they they're doing it is for power grab um because they know that we are 19 we don't have a dollar to our name and they're going to be able to take advantage of it so um those are just two very important things that i'd like to share with you guys that is that are actively occurring um but yeah and just to like insert an example right there like aisha and i because she was part of rios initiative at the beginning and we almost got like we got a season to letter from another climate organization because we were using their earth day idea and it's like why wouldn't you want everybody to be part as many people to be part of a day that symbolizes so much and you know try to sue a bunch of 17 year olds so it, that's just an example and this is a un organization also like um and we can't say anything because we send an nda and we can't talk to media about it uh so that's just an example of the things that we would use lawyers for also <laughs> Great, thank you so much for that. That's definitely a lot to think about. Um, and so in the interest of time, I will pass it to Arfi, who has one final round table question, and then we'll move on to Q&A. Hi, thank you so much for such an enlightening discussion, to be honest, and being so candid um, and vulnerable, it's, it's not easy. So thank you for that. My question, I guess, is um, sort of my search for hope in some way. So with the upcoming COP, and I know much has been said about how uh, the fossil fuel companies are gaming the system. There's not much that happens on the negotiation table, but where do you see hope in the next COP? And, and where do you see the sort of youth voice really pushing the envelope? And in the same order, I guess. Thank you. Well, I think we get asked this question so much that it feels like every time we get asked, we have to like look for hope and we have to look for why we do what we do. And I had this conversation with Aisha earlier and I told her the day that I understand why I do what I do is the day that it becomes meaningless. And with that, I mean that it's so innate that we just want a safe future for our children. It's so innate that we shouldn't be afraid of our future. It's so innate that I grew up with my parents telling me our role is to make the world a better place, that I can't really explain to you what keeps me going or what gives me hope, just that no movement has ever succeeded by thinking that it won't, that no movement will ever succeed by doubting itself. So I just have to keep going and I have to, uh, what's important instead, like rather than hope, what's important is fostering joy, fostering relationships. Uh, taking care of each other, taking care of the community, um, because we get sort of so caught up in hope that, you know, we think that we need to, you know, that it's like some some type of prize or some type of like thing that it's so sacred that you have to keep holding on to it. When in reality, is the other things that are important, and not being able to explain why you do what you do is probably one of the most dangerous things for the people who who want to tear us down because if we don't have anything that attaches us to to what we do except our hearts you know we're gonna we're in it for the long run thank you so much i feel like that's so true hope can be such a pressurizing kind of and, and sort of sort of Eldorado, i guess uh over to aisha and then the chef oh you switched up the order i did i did i just <laughs> went by the screens look at me well, I'm slightly nervous. Might as well be honest about it. Go ahead. Um, I have to follow Shea's uh, wonderful statement. It's going to be a little hard. Um, I agree with the fact that for me, this work is very much personal, deep, and innate. Um, and it kind of has to be um, when you start so young. Um, we When you can't put or attribute any sort of material gain to it, um, it kind of has to be emotional. Um, but I'm, I also wanted to say this, this is from like 
this is a little distant from the question, but um, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot. The climate crisis has brought to the surface a very real catastrophe that is approaching us. And it's something that we're denying. We're denying this specific catastrophe or we're refusing to accept it. However, catastrophes of war, of financial ruin, of, of everything that has actually built our current idea of a nation state are wholeheartedly accepted. Like we need to believe that some foreign power is going to hurt us and therefore we're going to put um, military all around our borders. And therefore we're going to give so much money to, um, to, to policing and military, militarism. Um, and it's given power to what we today consider nation states. It's why nation states have developed nuclear weapons as well. It's, it's this fear of catastrophe. However, climate disaster, which has, which science has proven again and again and again, will indeed lead to catastrophe. That's the one that we refuse to acknowledge because it's not profitable to the extent that um, it, is, it gives people unlimited power. Um, it's not profitable to the extent that um, it doesn't allow oligarchy or totalitar totalitarianism or like this one individual to say, hey, I can save you all and therefore you should put me in power. On the opposite, the climate disaster and climate catastrophe is asking, it's urging, it's pleading us to all work together. And I think that's the major difference for me. And I suppose that's also a place of hope. I know today I am so incredibly lucky to be on a panel with Shie and Disha and have the friends I have because deep in the like in my heart, I believe I am among the change makers of my time. I am among the MLKs and Nelson Mandela. These people will indeed be the ones to hold on to humanity. And even if we don't, um, I'll have, at the end of my lifetime, I'll have the capacity to say I did my best. And I was among people who tried again and again and again. Thank you so much, Aisha, for the spirit of trying and holding on to that. Um, over to the chef. I'm just like happy crying listening to both. <laughs> Um, um, I think I agree with both Sam, um, especially with what she said that, you know, every time they ask you why you're doing this, you, you're you forced to come up this, with this elaborate sob backstory that led you into why you're doing this, but and on, and for the reality is that we didn't do it for all those sob stories, we did it for, I mean, I personally did it for very selfish reasons, I, d I just don't want to a world where I, I can't wake up and see sparrows tomorrow. I don't want a world where I can't see my friend and I can't, you know, walk over to the houses. It was these very small things. They weren't the big things. They were just the fact that um, this is going to take away all the little joys I have. It was just that. And I think with COP especially, I have no hope from COP whatsoever because we've had 26 of these. Um, if they were really serious about doing anything in COP, they would have done it by now. They have all the money, they have all the power, they have all the resources at the tip of their fingers. So if they wanted to do something, they would have. So um, I think COP especially has just become a PR event. And I know I should call it a Coachella at one point, it was hilarious. Um, but yeah, it has become that because they don't want to do anything. It's just they want to showcase that they're doing something. It's it's essentially them, it's a huge life festival to the world where they come on and uh, tell us that they're doing something where in reality they aren't doing anything because they've had so many years, all like I said, all the resources. So I think us, yeah, like she said, us going to office is validating the, you know, the reality of it. 
but nothing really happens at cop i don't put my hope in cop i put my hope in the people i work with i put my hope in aisha and i put my hope in shea and i put my hope in you guys because i we are doing the work we've been doing the work and what we've gotten out of this is just nothing but honestly a lot of pain yes we've gotten a lot of community but i think it's just okay to admit that we've also gotten a lot of trouble and a lot of pain for the work we do uh and all for what and it sometimes it just does feel hopeless um but i i uh, i do practice hope on a daily basis like in the small things because um i strongly believe that if we can't reimagine a better future i don't think we're going to achieve it because if i actively don't work on thinking about a world where it isn't so painful to be doing the work we do i don't think we'll ever get there so um i i do practice hope in little, little ways um and uh, honestly most of it just comes from the community comes from these little things that we do together that's pretty much it thank you so much i think three really important uh, sort of insights right practicing hope keep trying and don't pressurize yourself to constantly be hopeful so that can be toxic as well um so i've got to hand it over to jackie again to take us through some of the q and a that we have excellent thanks rp um so i think we have time for rapid replies to one or two more q and a questions but before we get to that um i just wanted to flag that right after this there will be a closed door community of practice meeting of our clx uh, community of practice and for those of you who have been or are part of that um there's a separate zoom link that you've been sent um in your invitation and to those of you who would like to join our community of practice please email the email listed on the invitation that you received um and with that in mind um so this is to any of our wonderful panelists who would like to answer this um what do you see as the role of science in your work well i'll just say that science is like absolutely vital we cannot communicate anything about the state of the world without the work that scientists have done and i do think however that they need to evolved uh to what they are evolving of looking at the world in a systems way because science has has often been very concentrated in one topic which is the nature of science but an example is that in the united nations the biodiversity building is separate from the climate building and they never talk to each other and you can't separate climate and biodiversity so now there's this new um field of science or way of looking at science which is the planetary boundaries way um and that basically means that you see every part of the world as connected and um in these boundaries and our role as activists is to communicate this science um not only to policy makers to businessmen but also to each other and to our families to understand the state that we're we're in excellent thank you very much for that and if there are no other uh thoughts from Aisha or Disha um I guess this is a good place to close the webinar. Um I would like to really thank each of our panelists. This has been truly one of the most engaging and thoughtful webinars we've had. Um and it yeah, a, a lot of food for thought and for action. Um so thank you all for attending. Um to those in the community of practice, we'll see you in a minute. Um and yeah, uh have a good day everyone. Um yeah, goodbye.